Hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, workshop on preparing for the design career fair. So today we really are going to talk about how to prepare for the career fair, not just during it, but sort of what you can do uh, ahead of time to be successful in this event. So as I mentioned, two career fairs for, for your population. We have the in-person uh, design career fair on the uh, Friday the 24th. It runs from 11 a.m. until 4 p.m., uh, I, I totally appreciate that some of you have classes and conflicts and all these other things, and you don't have the full time in which to you know, leverage your time. Uh, we, we do encourage uh, your school and the department of faculty to sort of you know, make sure that you have that time to do that. Um, but uh, hopefully you can take advantage of that. The virtual fair is the following week on the 28th of February, and it runs from a shorter period of time. Uh, there's a um, smaller number of employers. There's over 60 um, for the in-person, there's about 21, I, I think, now for the virtual one. So uh, lots of opportunities to connect with different types of employers, depending on uh, your particular interest area. For the uh, in-person fair, what you need to do to sort of be ready for it is uh, you can go on to Handshake right now and you can register for the fair. You don't need to. You can turn up on the day and that's actually registering. But you, you can do that um, and, and register ahead of time. It means that you'll get notified every time when a new employer registers, right? So you can go there right now, you can see all the employers that are listed, but if an employer registers tomorrow and you've registered for the fair on Handshake, you'll get a notification saying this, this company has registered. So that might be a good way of keeping you uh, focused on, on who's coming. On the day of the event itself, you're gonna come to Houston Hall. We're in two rooms, Bodeck Lounge and the Hall of Flags. And you'll see that there'll be check-in desks and you'll come in with your pen card and you'll tap our things and you'll get a sticker with your name on. And that's all you really need to do to, to, to participate in the fair. And then you can go between the two rooms and engage with the employers um, in that way. You can, at a career fair, uh, bring your resume. You can bring portfolios with you. In this day and age, you know, people are bringing iPads and, and going through their portfolios, but you don't have to do any of those things, right? You can come to a career fair and engage with employers and ask them questions about their projects, about their internship programs, about their opportunities, about whatever you need to know or want to know about the employer. You don't have to be there just to share, uh, share your resume and your portfolio. But as part of this fair, some employers are open to you know, looking through your portfolio with you. Some are there just to answer questions um, about themselves. And, and you'll have to figure out who's who or, or which employer is which by sort of basically asking them you know, um, how you can engage with them. And I'll sort of talk about what that looks like in, in a second. You'll also need a, an introduction to yourself, right? So there are you know, 60, 70 tables there. You're going to approach a table. There may be a couple of representatives behind that table and they're going to look at you and you're going to walk up and then you're going to have to sort of initiate the conversation, right? So you're going to introduce yourself, your name, you'll have your name badge on so they can see that. But you'll have to say something about yourself. I'm a second year student. I'm focusing on this. I have a real interest in this type of design. I have a background in this, right? So whatever your narrative is that you want the employers to know about you, you have to sort of practice saying it, saying it loudly, saying it uh, confidently, and then transition to a question uh, to sort of get the, the conversation going, right? And the best questions are ones where you've done some research already on the employers and you're asking smart questions. The one thing that we get from employers every time that they really don't like at any career fairs, not just this one, but any career fairs, are students who come up to them and basically say, what do you do? Tell me about you, right? They've, they've done no work to sort of figure out who the, the employer is or no background research. So that research component into who these employers are and why you might be interested in them, you know, that's a, a really critical component to your career fair prep. The virtual career fair is uh, obviously, uh, you know, very different experience. Um, in order to participate in this, you must register on Handshake, right? Because it's all run through the Handshake platform. It's not open yet for student registration because employers are still registering. And what the employers have to do is they have to set up interview schedules. They say, you know, they have these 10 minute one-on-one -on -one schedules that they set up. And once those are set up and once student registration is open, you can go in and schedule a 10 minute block with an employer. And that's your, that's your engagement. And 10 minutes is actually a long time. Oftentimes in a real career fair, you don't get 10 minutes of protected time. There are people behind you, there's people beside you, it's lots going on. But the virtual space allows you a 10 minute one-on-one -on -one appointment. It's not an interview and, and employers, Sometimes think it might be, and students sometimes think it might be, but it's not. It's an engagement, it's an interaction, it's information, it's a discussion, it's you finding out information that you can uh, that you can leverage as you apply in the future for internships or full-time roles. So you have to sign up uh, ahead of time, and you have to go through the employers with their schedules, and you have to pick one-on-one -on -one schedule, one-on-one uh, -on -one appointments or one-on-one -on -one slots. 
with each of the employees that you're interested in. And that becomes your schedule for the day. And then during that 12 to 4 p.m. period, you would go in and you would engage virtually with them through on your computer um, in video, uh, video chat form um, and um, you know, learn about them, ask your questions and engage. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, but it's the same premise, right? You, you still need to do your research into the employee. You still need to have a, a introduction to you. You still need to be able to ask good, smart questions based on your research. And you still need to be able to share maybe your resume, maybe your portfolio or a link to those things as part of that engagement. There are benefits and, and sort of not so much benefits for both of these venues, right? The, the uh, traditional career fair where you're in person, it's, it's overwhelming, it's loud, it's either hot or it's cold or it's uh, too many people for introverts, it's, it's very hard to manage. The virtual career fair has to a certain extent technology issues. Sometimes, you know, the, the technology doesn't work and you can't connect, but it's a, it's a much, I think, more predictable and scheduled experience. So for people with introverted tendencies, it's much easier to know that you'll be meeting with this person at this time for 10 minutes and there's nobody around you, and there's, there's not too much um, uh, sort of other stimuli in the environment that can uh, that can sort of knock you off there. So certainly you're going to engage with employees in both of these events, but leverage them to their to the you know leverage the benefits of each style of the events. The the traditional fair where you're walking around, you will engage with lots more people, and and you'll get a better sense of who people are. But the virtual career fair, you can have that ten minutes of protected time that's going to be so helpful for you. If we think about then some of these best practices that I've, I've begun to sort of touch on already, you so, so for the uh, in-person fair, you can go onto Handshake now, you can see all the employers that have registered. Many of them will have posted jobs as part of the career fair registration. So you'll look at the employer and then you'll see that they have jobs posted. You know, for, for many of your fields, it, they're not surprising internships or jobs, they're architecture jobs or planning jobs. So they're, they're, they're not too uh, distinct, but the more you know about those positions, the better questions that you can have for the employers who you'll be uh, uh, meeting with. When you go to a career fair, you're not actually um, applying for a role sort of officially, right? So you might have a resume, you might give it to the employer, they might look at it, they might put it in their pile. But in most cases, and I say most because employers can do whatever they like, but in most cases, that's not the actual application, right? You're still going to apply online to something so that you're in their systems. So what you can actually do at a career fair is actually gain knowledge that makes your application, your future application better, right? What you take away from a conversation, you can actually use in, in your resume. And so that's one way that I would see these types of engagements is not, I'm here to apply, but I'm here to learn more so that when I do apply, I'm a better candidate. The resume book is still not necessarily an application, right? So all, anyone who submits a resume, we're gonna send that whole book of resumes to the employers, to every employer that's coming. They can look through that. And what we're encouraging the employers to do is to contact students that they're interested in based on going through that resume book. Now, there could be hundreds of resumes in there, right? So I don't know how employers will necessarily sort through that. Keyword is obviously going to be an important aspect. They might scan and look for other things. Um, but that's an opportunity for employers to reach out to you. Don't assume that they have seen it. Don't assume that they've you know, read it ahead of time. You're going to still bring your resume with you. But that's another avenue where we try to encourage employers to connect with um, students because you know, they've seen something interesting in their resume. Um, and then just as a reminder, these, you know, in most cases, and I say most every time, but these, in most cases, they're not interviews, right? You're not there to say, I'm, I'm applying for this internship and I'm here to sort of, you know, uh, to have an interview for it. It's information gathering is what you're doing. Some employers are going to set up uh, interview spaces. In our building, we have an on-campus interviewing suite with different rooms. Uh, we've offered that opportunity to employers. And so they may set up spaces there. And they may connect with students ahead of time and try to get up interviews in that space separate from the career fair. Um, some employers have actually done this in Houston Hall as well. They've, they've just set up a table somewhere unofficially and, and have sort of interviewed with students on the side. That's perfectly fine, too. They can they can do that. But that's sort of a discrete interview scenario. Right. That's not what happens in the career fair where there are 10 people lined up behind you to talk to, to the employer. So come at it with a more information gathering mindset but also be you know, ready to share who you are and why you're excited about these, uh, these different employers. In terms of you know, where we are in the world right now, you can certainly still wear a mask if you're comfortable doing that. Um, most employers that I've seen at the career fairs are not wearing masks, but that doesn't change what you um, can and want to do. If you're not wearing a mask, obviously smile. Or if you are wearing a mask, even smiling with your eyes is important. Shaking hands, you know, we pre-pandemic you know, gave instructions that have good firm handshakes. 
I don't think people necessarily want that or need that right now. So um, do, feel free not to, to worry about that. Um, but if, if they want, they extend a hand and you want to shake the hand, that's great. If you don't want to shake the hands, you can just say, you know, my apologies, I'm not shaking hands right now. I hope you understand. And then you know, move into your introduction. Your introduction, you know, should be more than you handing them a resume and saying, here I am, right? Your resume is not you. You are a better version of your resume than your resume is. And so when you are engaging with them, uh, you know, the resume is a, uh, it's background. They can hold it. They can look at it. But you, you and what you say is much more important. So be ready with that sort of introduction where you sort of give them some insight into who you are, uh, what you're excited by, what you're working on right now, and then what you know about them. Right? I see you have a couple of positions. You know, I've spoken with a couple of my colleagues who, or sort of, a couple of my peers who were interns at your organization last year. Right? Demonstrate that you've done some of the the, the background research, and and they will uh, they will appreciate that. Um, and then move into the question phase, right? Because the question is is what sort of keeps the conversation going uh, as you're as you're progressing through that your interaction. Um, you can ask them what they're looking for. You can ask them what skills they're seeking. You can ask them about the projects that an intern will be working on. You can ask them when deadlines are. You can ask them how best to apply for a role, right? So many questions that you can you can ask them. Um, you can ask them if you can share your portfolio with them. So this is what I mentioned earlier in terms of, you know, don't just come in there and say, here's my portfolio and start sort of flipping pages because that, that may not be what they're interested in seeing or doing. So you can say, can I share some of my work with you? Um, and then, you know, you can go through that. Um, uh, and if they say yes, obviously, you can then share some of that work. Now, again, in a in a in-person fair, there may be 15 people behind you also wanting to do that. It, it doesn't mean that you necessarily have to rush through it, but you do have to sort of be aware of uh, what's going on around you. And so, you know, I sort of came up with this portfolio etiquette, which I thought, you know, might might be helpful because you only have limited time, which means that if you have a 50 page portfolio, it's probably not gonna be the place where you flip through every one of your projects, you know, page by page and go through that. My suggestion is to think about which projects that you've done speak most to the, the types of projects that the their, that organization does, or speak most to the, the style of design or the tools that you've used that you really want to showcase. And then sort of say that, say, look, I have my portfolio here, but let me show you just a couple of projects that I think really stand out that you might be interested in, or that might demonstrate something that I think you'd be interested in, right? And that's a, a really great way of being thoughtful of their time, respectful of your, uh, you know, other students at Penn, but also demonstrate that you've, uh, that you are strategic in the way that you're presenting your information. Um, so, you know, I think you, you just want to sort of, you want to be uh, aware, you also want to take the opportunity to, to share your skills, but don't go through the entire portfolio and say, you know, this is me, because that, that, that doesn't help them understand you to the degree that I think, um, you know, you can help them understand if, you, if you're really more strategic about what you want to show them and, and, and are thoughtful in that way. For your portfolio, obviously, you know, as you're designing your portfolio, we don't really give portfolio advice here at Career Services, but, you know, prioritize within your own portfolio at any point in time for any application, the projects that are most relevant to the organization that you're applying to. If you're creating a portfolio that you're sending for a job as part of a job application, and your most exciting project or your most relevant project is on page 57 of that portfolio, that's not going to help you because they may not get to that far. So, you know, prioritize the order in which you're presenting some of your projects sometimes. That may not work in the career fair because you're speaking with lots of people, but just good general advice. And then at the end of your interaction, you know, you've had a conversation, you've asked some questions, they've given you some information. Uh, then you sort of have to wrap up the conversation, right? And so if they have given you information about what you can do next, if you want to apply for the internships, then do this. Then, you know, you can say, great, you know, thank you for letting me know about the, um, the you know, where to apply. I'm going to go ahead and submit my resume tomorrow. If you are chatting with a, uh, you know, a Penn alum who's come back representing the firm, they'll have a little sticker on their badge saying Penn alumni. You might say, you know, can I, you know, connect with you after this just to ask a few more questions? You know, I realize there are lots more people behind me, but I do have a couple more questions. Is it all right if I reach out? Right? So you can sort of think about it as a networking opportunity as well. Um, you should, if possible, at the end of the fair, virtual or in person, um, follow up with a, a brief thank you email to anyone that you spoke with, right? So you can jot down their name, you can find their email and basically just say, thank you so much for taking the time to be at the Design Career Fair. You know, I was the person who asked you about this question. I really appreciated your insight. That's it. You don't have to give them, you don't have to ask another question, you don't have to follow up. You're just thanking them for their time. It's a very professional way of doing that. And it might actually lead to further engagement uh, moving forward. 
And then most importantly, whatever you learn from your engagement and your interaction, use that information. Right? If you learn about the what this uh, organization does or their style of work, that may be something that you can mention in a, in a cover letter when you're applying. If you know that they value certain skills or knowledge areas, those are things that you might integrate into your resume more effectively, right? So don't just have a conversation and move on and leave your resume and think that's the end of it. Really leverage that um, information moving forward. You can name drop the person that you spoke with in a cover letter. You can name drop that person in an interview that you have. I really enjoy chatting with, you know, so-and-so at the Penn Design Career Fair. That really gave me some insight, right? That name dropping is really helpful because it sort of decreases the gap between you and them, you know, because they, 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 you seem more familiar now because you know this person and you've already uh, spoken with that person. So a uh, really great way of making sure that you're using the interaction, not just having an interaction at, at a career fair. Let's jump over to the, the virtual side of, of things. So very similar in terms of what your goal is with the career fair. The benefits, obviously, is that, you know, there are no lines to be in. You know what time you're meeting with. You just have to remember that you have that moment in time and not miss it. Uh, you've scheduled it, scheduled it in advance. You, you know your timetable moving forward. You, you know, you know, have time to look at the employer's website beforehand. Um, and you have that 10 minutes of dedicated time. Now, you have to test your technology and make sure it works. Uh, and it's a really great idea not to sort of schedule, you know, 20 appointments back to back because you're, you're not going to stay on time if you do that. Some employers will actually have info sessions. Design employers tend not to do it as much as other employers, but these are sort of 30 minute sessions that they can have a, a, an open room where lots of students can come in and they talk about you know, broader things that are applicable to lots of people. So keep an eye out for those as well as the one-on-one -on -one sessions. Those are just different ways of, of learning about the employer. And then obviously if it's snowing or raining, you don't have to worry about finding a place for your bag or your, your coat or anything like that. So lots of benefits, I think, for, for the virtual side of things. Um, when you go on to Handshake and you look at this, the virtual uh, design career fair, they're, they're two different events, the in-person and the virtual, you'll see that registration for students doesn't open up until the 21st. Again, this gives the employers time to set up their schedules so that when you do register, all of those schedules are set, or at least most of those schedules will be set, and you can uh, schedule your one-on-one -on -one appointments. Um, so don't jump over there now and see that, but you can follow that little blue, I don't know what it's meant to be, a bookmark, I suppose. If you follow the fair, anyone who registers um, uh, any employer who registers, you'll be notified of that as well, right? So if you want to keep an eye out on if, if anyone new has come in. We've had two or three register in the last um, two to three days. So the employers are still active uh, doing that. These are the, fair, so there's, as I said, there's over 60 employers for the in-person, so I didn't list those. These are the current ones listed for the virtual career fair coming up. Um, I know SWA is often popular, HK is popular. Um, some of these other ones are, are popular too. So uh, keep an eye on that. What we are doing right now is we're reaching out to them, making sure that they have their schedule set up. Um, but when that registration opens for students, you can go in and then schedule one-on-one -on -one appointments or group appointments if they have those uh, for these organizations. So an exciting group of people there to, to, to be able to chat with. Okay, let's sort of broaden out our perspective now about sort of career fairs. I just want to sort of put them into um, context about how they can help you not just apply for things that might be in front of you, but even if you're sort of trying to figure out where to apply or who to apply to or what direction to take, there's lots of questions that you can ask at a career fair that are helpful. And so these are these are broad ones, not necessarily specific just to design students, but they are the types of questions that a career fair is really great, uh, uh, a great opportunity to, to ask at, right? So... You can ask about the projects that they're working on um, because knowing what projects they're working on allows you to position yourself for those projects. You may have done work on similar types of projects. The more you know about what's coming up, you know, on their in their portfolio moving forward, you can see if they posted a job and you can ask about the job. I see that you're looking for this. When you're looking at resumes, what do you look for? Or when you're looking at portfolios, what do you look for that illustrates that skill that you, you said you're looking for, right? Because that gives you actionable advice, things that you can change in your materials uh, to make your application better. Um, people always ask questions about timelines, right? When your internship's open, I don't see them posted right now. They may have answers to those questions and they may say now, now it's open now. Or they may say, you know, these will be opening up in the next few weeks. That will give you a little bit more certainty about your schedule. Um, you may have a firm that sort of, you know, it's a multidisciplinary firm, does a bit of planning, it does a bit of design, architecture, landscape architecture. And you might say, look, I have this combination of backgrounds. I have a background in architecture. I'm doing landscape architecture now. I'm doing a certificate in planning. You know, what types of roles do you think would value, would my skill set be a, a valuable for in your organization? Right. So you might learn more about the different departments or niches or projects that the organization has 
so that you can focus your attention on applying for the right roles or the right places. Um, and so that's a good question as well. You might sort of be early on in your process. You might be in your first year and you might be here for another three years, but you might know exactly that these are the firms that you're interested in. And so the questions you can ask is, what can I do over the next two or so years to demonstrate that you know, I'm a, I can bring value to this organization? What, what would you look for in terms of experiences or skills, right? And then you can use that knowledge over the next two years to build those skills or gain those experiences. So, so much you can gain from these types of conversations that aren't just about the here and now of, you know, I'm looking for an internship or, or a full-time job, which you may be, and it's great if you can have those conversations too, but th there are other things that uh, you can ask as well. And I encourage you to sort of take advantage of it. It's basically the, the easiest form of networking that you can do because these employers are basically paying to come to campus, right? And, and, and they're sort of stuck behind a table in person or virtually for four or five hours, right? So it's a really great opportunity to take the most advantage of it, um, not just talking at them, but trying to get information from them uh, at the same time. Um, and this sort of, sort of summarizes that, right? Because I, I think if you can listen to people, you ask questions about their projects, you ask questions about what skills they're seeking, and you can listen to the way that they're describing what they're looking for, that is language that you can then use to talk about your skills, right? So if you say, what are some of the design skills that you really value? And they give you a description of what they really value, your job is to use that language that you hear them using to describe those skills from, you know, based on your experience. So it's really about, you know, matching language to their language, to their language, right? Matching expectations that they have on skills to what you actually bring. And your resume and your portfolio are the vehicles that you're using to really illustrate those skills and those experiences um, in action. So um, you know, be, be an active listener, make sure that you take you know, a moment to write down what you hear from these conversations before you jump into the next one so that you can, you can leverage that, that information. Which sort of takes us to the, to the resume best practices that I want to share. Um, again, just broadly, because you know, I think every resume is a customized, tailored version of yourself, specific to one audience, at one firm, right? So you're gonna customize as much as possible. I want to give you some general best practices to sort of keep you on track to have a, a really effective illustration of your skills. <clears throat> first things first, we have the resume books. The deadline for submitting your resume to these will be the 15th of February. At that point in time, we'll combine them all together and we will share them with all of the employers, virtually and uh, in person, and they can look at those. Uh, the link to that is on our website. You'll see that there are folders that you can select and then you can go ahead and, and upload your resume. You should make sure that your file name is your name, not just resume. So many people just have resumes as their file name. Uh, PDF is great. You should not upload anything other than a resume. Uh, no portfolios. The portfolios are too big and they're, they're, they're too long. It, just, it doesn't work for a resume book. If you want to make sure that your portfolio is included, have a link to it. If you have a website or, or another document that you do that you have, have a link to your portfolio in your resume, right up at the top, link to portfolio, right? So you don't have to include the actual portfolio in the resume book. Okay, here are my five best practices then for, for your resume. Number one is to sort of think about whether you want to start off your resume with basically the conclusions of your resume, right? A resume is a document that I can read through. And then at the end of that reading, I sort of come up with my idea of who you are or what you can do or what skills that you have, right? So I start at the top and I go down to the bottom and then I, I draw my own conclusions. If you start off with the conclusions, it helps me as the reader know what to look for and it helps me know what to take away from reading the resume. And so it's not essential to have a sort of a summary section at the top, but it can be a way of really helping the reader understand you better. The resume is a narrative and it should be, in most cases, specific to a certain type of audience. Now, at a career fair, you're going to have a general one, but in most cases, you want the resume to really give the reader takeaways that they can use. So your core interests, your core skills, your core experiences can sort of be summarized in different ways uh, at the top of the resume. And so what does that look like, right? So these are sort of exam general examples of what a, a summary sort of could be, right? The, the first two are more descriptive narrative sort of summaries, two years of experience as a liaison between com uh, community groups and government agencies, familiarity with budget preparation and so on. The third one here, these are all separate summaries. The third one is more skills-based. Now, none of these are sort of you know, design specific, but if you were an architect and you wanted to demonstrate that you have experience with tiny projects and super tall building projects, that could be part of your summary, right? Extensive experience designing small and super tall buildings. That, that could be one of the takeaways that you have. If you have experience in 
uh, sort of the robotics of architecture and you want to talk about that, that could be a key summary that you, you have. So this just helps the reader understand what they should walk away with. Um, and it's something that, you know, at Chris Services, we can help you think about, um, but it's driven by what you would actually like the employer to know about you. That's sort of how you start off with, uh, with these summary statements. In terms then of, of the information that you're providing, make sure that you're also prioritizing within the document the things that are most important. I'm going to use samples from different styles of resumes, so not just from design resumes, just to illustrate this. So this is a perfectly good education section. There's the institution, there's the degree, there's a capstone project, could be a studio project in your, in your world, and there's coursework. But if this person was applying for a role uh, as a sustainability analyst, where they were looking for GIS skills, right now those courses that are listed um, that mention uh, sustainability and GIS are sort of buried within that section. Right? So an obvious fix for this, for a job where sustainability and GIS are valued, is to shift things around so that those are the first things that the employer sees, not sort of buried in the middle. It's a very small change that can have a, a, a big difference to the employer because you're prioritizing the information and making it easier for them to see the things that you want them to have, right? Very small change, but it's part of the customization that you can do for each of your applications. Here's a skill section that does the same thing, right? So these are all skills that someone can have and they list them in the skill section. Again, you wanna list them in the skill section. You wanna demonstrate them in action, the experience section. So they're gonna be sort of captured twice. But if the role specifically mentioned AutoCAD and Revit, right, you can see that these are sort of buried at the bottom of the skill section. An easy fix to prioritize this would be to move the entire architecture sort of subheading to the top and move those two skills to the forefront. Right now, obviously there are other skills that they're looking for. This is just a, a basic illustration. But these are the types of small changes that I think um, you can easily enact when you're customizing your resume uh, for particular applications. The main part of the, the document then is going to be your bullet points, where you actually describe the things that you're doing. And it's worth thinking about how these fit in with your portfolio, right? Your portfolio, in many cases, depending on your field, is the outcome of the work that you've done. It's an illustration of the thing that you've designed or the project that you've worked on. It doesn't always talk about the skills that you use to do that, whether those are collaboration skills, technology skills, project management skills, design skills, or whatever that is, right? The resume is a skills-focused document. So all of the skills that you use to do a project want to be illustrated, or at least all of the relevant ones to your audience want to be illustrated. The cover letter is where you tell stories about why you did some of these things, right? It's a more personal document. And we're not really touching on cover letters today because you don't need those for uh, career fairs. So when you're writing about your skills in a resume, when you have these bullet points, there are three main points that you want to cover. The skill that you're using or that you have used that is relevant to your audience, the context in which you use that skill, and then in many cases, the outcome that's connected with that. You won't always have a sort of a significant outcome, but anytime that you do have an outcome, it's good to mention that. The outcome might be a completed project. The outcome might be an award as part of a competition. The outcome might be a novel design approach or a new technology that you learned, right? Or a new collaboration that you formed, right? Lots of different ways of doing that. Where the context is relevant to the organization that you're applying to, you can talk about it a lot. Where the context is less relevant, you want to spend much more time on the skill itself because the skill is what's transferable. You're not going to bring that project with you, but you are going to bring the skill with you. This is what I often see when I look at um, resumes, um, you know, first draft resumes. People come in with bullet points that, that look like this, created drawings, worked on public exhibit, gave presentation, right? And the challenge here is when you read your bullet points, in your mind, you see something very different from when I read your bullet points because you live that experience, right? You're like, I did it. I know what I did. I, it was great. I did lots of things. And when you read these things, your brain fills in all the gaps. When I read it, I only have the words on the piece of paper, right? And I can't really create an image of you or your skills or the value that you bring based on these descriptions. So you need to be a little bit more descriptive to create very key um, imagery in my head so I can imagine you doing these things. The better I can imagine you doing these things, the easier it is for me to imagine you in the roles that you're applying to. Right, so these are just broader descriptions of what those things could be looked like, right? So rather than just research, it's research and selected planting and paving materials created concept diagrams using AutoCAD and Rhino, produced hand drawings for these things, right? So they're, they're just a little bit more detail. You can integrate the scale and the scope of the project. Was it a tiny project? Was it a 20,000 square foot project? Was it 50 stories or two stories, right? Whatever the, the scale is that you are using to describe your work, you can integrate some of those descriptors to illustrate to the reader the knowledge that you have and the skills that you use. 
So make it descriptive, make it so that I can picture you doing these things. Uh, and that's sort of your goal with, with the resume. Here are just other examples, right? Designed and implemented new building condition and tracking systems using these tools and became the, the go-to person in the office for this software application, right? So this was an outcome. People came to me as the content expert for this area. Quantifying things with numbers makes it more tangible, makes it more believable. So these are things that you can do uh, as well to make these things come to life. So if you have a half line bullet point, if your bullet point is made up of only six words, for example, it's probably not gonna be enough to give a clear illustration of your skills in action. So look at your resume and say, do I need to provide more context to really illustrate what that skill looks like. Formatting is important only because you don't want anyone to ever notice your formatting, right? You just want them to notice the content. And so if you have great formatting, it means that no one sees it. If you have poor formatting, it means that people can see it. Oftentimes when you're trying to sort of condense things down to a one page version, which is perfectly great for you know, an internship, even for some uh, full-time roles, uh, you know, cr people cram in things and it's too crowded and it's overwhelming. And it's sort of, it's the difference between a, you know, a weed infested forest versus a nice airy promenade with a summer breeze coming through it, right? You, everyone would choose the one on the right here and everyone choose to read a resume that has enough white space to navigate through. So think about the spacing to give the reader the ability to understand your experience. If it's too crowded, it's mentally confusing and, and overwhelming. If it's spaced out consistently and appropriately, it's easy to see and easy to navigate through. For those of you who are designers and, and architects, Think about it as you know, one of your projects. Think about helping people navigate through the space. Formatting, again, you get to choose what it is and, and there's no right or wrong way of doing this, but think about how you can prioritize the information and streamline that information being transmitted to your reader. So this example here, there's a lot of formatting. There's bold, there's plain text, there's italics. Uh, things that are in bold are not necessarily important. Like Philadelphia PA is not important, but it's bolded. So you, know, you can do a very quick change. And this is just a suggestion again, not a thing you have to do. Bold the degree, bold the institution, keep everything else plain text. Um, and it, you know, it stands out easily. It's easy to see the things that are most important, right? So just be consistent, be thoughtful, um, and, and think about how best to communicate the information to your audience. This one is a, a one that catches a lot of people, the, the hyphens between dates. Does anyone care that they're different? I guarantee if you look through your resume, you'll see some inconsistencies. People may not see it, they may not care, but if you are designing a, you know, a 70, uh, story building, getting your design right is important. If your doors are different sizes, your windows are different sizes, and they're all meant to be the same, it's, it's it's sort of an issue, right? So attention to detail in your resume is, is important. If you can't get it right on a one-page version of yourself, are you going to be able to do it for a giant project, right? So be consistent because someone else may see this and decide that this is a, a, a not a good indicator of your attention to detail or your design uh, aesthetic. And then finally, and sort of most importantly, get feedback on it, right? So obviously you can come to career services and we'll give you feedback. You can use our graduate peer career advisors. They have appointments available um, now, if not now, tomorrow. Um, you know, get some input from it, from your peers, um, you know, so that you're, it's not just you because your, um, your understanding of your resume is affected by what your brain um, interprets from it. Not from, you know, when the reader looks at it, I, as I said, it's just the words that you put on the paper, we, we have no other context. So those words have to be meaningful. The more that you can do networking, the more that you can connect with people at a career fair and learn from their experience and then use that to update your materials, the better those materials um, are going to be. So yes, the content of your resume is really important. The skills, the keywords, the experience is so important. Because you're in a design field, the formatting is important um, because you don't want to have that be an issue, but it's only important because it helps people understand the content better. It should not be, you cannot make a resume look so fancy that someone's gonna interview you or hire you because you've made it look fancy. It's, it just doesn't work that way. The last thing that's important is you plus. And what is you plus? You plus is all the other things that you bring to a conversation, your energy, the way that you describe yourself, your uh, proactiveness of doing research into an organization and, and knowing about them and asking smart questions and following up with a thank you note, all those things that sort of add energy and, and um, you know, an element of dynamic engagement with an employer. That's most important, right? You are a better version of your resume than your resume is. And so you really want to lean into that uh, at a career fair and at these types of engagements and at networking events um, as a part of your professional identity.
So let's wrap up with a, a few resources. Um, again, I'll, I'll put the link in the chat in just a second, but some of those things that I've included include a link to the Beyond Graduate School platform. This is a platform specifically for master students trying to make the best of their investment in their graduate school. Uh, there's a whole bunch of resources here. There's one on resumes for internships. There's one on resumes for, um, well, I get to that one. There's, there's one on navigating career fairs, right? So I put a link to that uh, one in there. Uh, so this will more specifically talk about sort of the, the experience of navigating career fairs. So do take advantage of that. And then we have these two ones here, resumes for internships, resumes for full-time jobs. Again, the content's not going to differ too much, but they'll give different examples of what that can look like. Um, so do take advantage of the Beyond Graduate School um, platform. It, it is custom made for you.